Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Canada's Prison Needle Exchange Program, Lessons Learned and Accessibility. I am Signe Berger. I am a project manager at the National Collaborating Center for Infectious Diseases. I am primarily focused on sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections, and I will be your moderator today. The National Collaborating Center for Infectious Diseases is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to provide knowledge translation and evidence for use in public health planning and policy. We offer a range of knowledge translation and brokering, including webinars such as this one, podcasts, evidence reviews, discussions and gatherings, infographics, quick references, and much more. I would like to begin by acknowledging that NCCID is hosted by the University of Manitoba on Treaty 1 land, the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Today's webinar will explore key barriers and recommendations to Prison Needle Exchange Program, or PNEP, access and enrollment. PNEP was implemented in 2018 by Correctional Service Canada to provide people in prisons with access to sterile injection equipment. This is the sixth webinar of our series titled Corrections as Public Health Settings for Sexually Transmitted and Bloodborne Infections Testing and Care. Through evidence reviews, podcasts, and webinars, we've been focusing on corrections as public health sites looking at the movement of people in and out of incarceration and the role for public health in the testing, treatment, and follow-up of sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections, or STBBIs. This series aims to support public health and correctional health departments across Canada in sharing knowledge to improve practices for the prevention, testing, and treatment, and care of STBBIs, including hepatitis C, and HIV in correctional settings. In this webinar, you will understand the rationale for prison needle and syringe programs in Canada, understand the approach to prison needle exchange program or PNEP adopted by Correctional Service Canada, understand the barriers this approach opposes to participation and learn about the recommendations proposed in response to these barriers. Before we begin, I would like to mention some housekeeping items. The question and answer session today will be taking place using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Please submit questions for our speakers through this tab. You can also like other people's questions to push them up in priority. We will try to answer as many questions as possible, but it is possible that we might not get to all of them today. All attendees are muted during the webinar and the chat box for participants is disabled. The hosts will use the chat box for extra communication to participants, so please keep an eye on that tab as well. The recording of this webinar will be available shortly after the webinar finishes at nccid.ca. And if you have technical problems with Zoom, please email nccid at nccid at umanitoba.ca. I would now like to introduce our speakers for today. Sandra Kahanchu is a lawyer and co-executive director of the HIV Legal Network, a human rights organization that works to uphold the rights of people living with and affected by HIV. She works on HIV-related human rights issues concerning prisons, drug policy, harm reduction, sex work, women, and immigration, and has helped guide the legal network's litigation in key court cases in Canada and internationally, including lawsuits challenging the Canadian government's failure to adopt prison-based needle and syringe programs and criminal laws governing sex work. Sandra was called to the bar of British Columbia in 2003. Rhiannon Thomas has been working in harm reduction in Toronto for almost 20 years in drop-ins, shelters, and community health centers, doing case management, trustee support, needle exchange, outreach, and research. She is a founding member of the Toronto Harm Reduction Alliance and a board advisor with the Women's Harm Reduction International Network. <laughs> 
She is currently the strategic lead for the Counterfeit Harm Reduction Program at South Riverdale Community Health Centre and a researcher with the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. I will now pass it on to our speakers. Thank you, Signe. Uh, I, I uh, spoke with Rhiannon and we're going to divide the presentation between us. Um, Thank you to NCCID for inviting us to talk about our work on around prison needle and syringe programs and our recent study that um, the Legal Network and RIEN were leading um, last year. So I have some slides which I'm going to share now. Hopefully they show up. Can people see my screen? Great. Okay, so we called this um, presentation Points of Perspective, which is the title of a report that we uh, published last year around CSC's Prison Needle Exchange Program. I just wanted to start by saying that I am situated today in Toronto, which is Treaty 13 territory. I'm very grateful to work um, on this territory and to share some of our findings, which cover uh, prison needle exchange programs across the, this land. So why did we start this advocacy? Um, the HIV Legal Network, where I work as a human rights organization, we've been around for three decades. And since our inception, it has been clear, and I'm sure many of the audience knows that there are very high rates of HIV and hepatitis C in the federal and provincial prison systems, um, due in part to the sharing of drug use, uh, drug injection equipment inside. The numbers have varied over the years. So when we, when I first started the legal network, um, rates of HIV in the federal prison system, as documented by the Correctional Service of Canada, was close to 5%. So extraordinarily high much higher than it is in the, they, was in the community. I think the numbers are down to around 1% today based on what I've seen from research and some of CSC's own research. Rates of hepatitis C at the time were in the middle 30s, like in the 30 some 35-ish percent. I think again, with new hepatitis C treatments, those numbers have been brought down. But this was a scenario we're confronted with uh, back in the late 90s when we started this work and into the early 2000s uh, when we ultimately decided to, to initiate a, a court challenge against Correctional Service of Canada in 2012. We, we were advocating for many years to implement this harm reduction measure that was available in the community for many years. And um, at the time there was a federal conservative government. Um, uh, the Minister of Public Safety at the time was a man named Stockwell Day, who some of you probably remember. He canceled the safer tattooing program we saw that there was really no prospect for anything related to harm reduction in, in under that government. And so we decided to initiate a lawsuit. And you have some pictures here. This is PASAN, which is a community partner that we work very closely with and also advise on the study. Producers with HIV AIDS Support Action Network. They were documenting people using all sorts of things to create um, makeshift drug use equipment. And I'm sure Rihanna will also talk a little bit about that. But at the time they're using this particular type of roller pen to create um, injection equipment. And they, um, so we, this this is what people were contending with. A lot of injection drug use inside, which persists to this day, and using makeshift equipment to, to inject and sharing that equipment across many people. So when we were starting this um, advocacy, we wanted to document what exists outside of Canada. And um, the first program that we were aware of started in Switzerland uh, more than 30 years ago. It was actually an act of civil disobedience. There's a Swiss doctor who saw that people were sharing a lot of injection equipment. And he said, this is not acceptable. People are getting uh, HIV and hepatitis C. And so he started distributing equipment on his own. And, and over the years, the programs have expanded. They exist in um, a number of different countries now, and they adopt one of four different models. So... The research shows that these are um, these are just four main models. One is a dispensing machine, and you see a picture there, where you insert a used uh, needle or syringe, and uh, you get a new one uh, through this dispensing machine. It's automated, and ideally put in a place that's out of view of security. Um, there's also healthcare distribution, which is a model that the the prison doctor used in Switzerland, where either doctor or nurse will provide the equipment. Um, to a person who comes to see them, and maybe is they're also responsible for, for disposal and exchange subsequently. The third model is, is a peer distribution model, which exists in Moldova and Luxembourg. And it, the very interesting story about peer distribution is it, it started out in Moldova um, after healthcare distribution model did not work. So in Moldova, they started out with um, either a nurse or doctor distributing the equipment. And 
nobody was accessing the program in Moldova. And they wanted to find out why. And people said it, it's because we don't trust uh, that our privacy and confidentiality would be protected, that um, the fact that healthcare knows is a huge impediment to us participating. So the Moldova prison system said, let's try this other model of peer distribution where uh, people in prison were trained as distributors. They would give be given access to the equipment and they would distribute it amongst their peers. And then they saw dramatic increases in participation in Moldova as a result. And Luxembourg subsequently also adopted this model. And then the final model is external NGO distribution, meaning an organization like PESAN or any other needle exchange program or harm reduction program would go into the prison system and um, uh, do the distribution um, which preserves some confidentiality. And there's pros and cons for all these different models, which you've documented in other research. Um, but these are the four main models that exist around the world. And most of them have been around for more than two decades. And so what we sought to do um, shortly after we initiated the lawsuit, so we said we initiated in Ontario in 2012, and we said, let's talk to people who have experience with the prison systems to see what they think would work in Canada, because obviously our prison systems are very different around the world. And so um, uh, uh, Dr. Emily Vandermeulen, who we also worked with on this project that Rhiannon will share, um, was the, the lead academic on this project. Um, and the HIV Legal Network and PASAN worked on this research. Uh, we spoke to people who'd been released from a federal prison system within the last six years, and people who worked in the prison system, like uh, healthcare staff, harm reduction workers, et cetera. We didn't actually talk to people inside the prison system because we weren't able to get permission from the Correctional Service of Canada to conduct that research. And we, we know that has been in the past a huge barrier. So what they told us when we spoke to people was that there was strong support for um, a hybrid approach. So one where there's a dispensing machine um, where you can get um, you have greatest anonymity and people very much emphasize that it, they wanted that machine to be out of view of security because that would be Otherwise, it would sort of be counterintuitive that if security were to know. So a dispensing machine model that's accessible to everyone, combined with some kind of face-to-face -face support, either through healthcare, through um, a peer distribution model, or through an NGO distribution. So any a, a combination of, of models where you have sort of a face-to-face -face element, if, if desirable, and a an, an more anonymous approach. And they said this would sort of uh, be tailored to the different institutions, like maybe if in one institution, people have a great relationship with the nurse there, then maybe a face-to-face -face approach with uh, the nursing staff would be a good approach with a machine, or maybe in another context where there's regular or routine visits from PASAN, for instance, maybe that would be work better. So it'd be tailored to the institution. So that was what we um, learned from our research now seven years ago. And then we came up with some recommendations based on that research. Um, we said, very, very importantly, and this is a, something that we'll, Rianne, I'm sure we'll talk about, is that access to the supplies should always be easy, confidential, and not subject to discipline. There should be regular information and education and support from trained personnel about safer injection. There should be multiple distribution points, which is what I just mentioned, like more than one uh, way to access the equipment. There should be ongoing and meaningful consultation with an education for relevant stakeholders. And so it shouldn't just sort, sort of stop with the introduction of the program. Um, it should evolve as necessary if there are, we see barriers to, to access, um, that people who are incarcerated should also play an active role in determining the way the program works, and that we should also just a broader recommendation to address drug use, not as a criminal issue. So this came out in 2016, still in the midst of the litigation. So we started in 2012, and this was sort of midway through our court case. So... Um, also, in the midst of the court case, there was a change of government to a liberal uh, federal government, and then Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodale announced, um, and we found it at the same time as everybody else did, it was through a media release, uh, despite the litigation and ongoing conversations, that they were going to introduce a needle and syringe program, a, a PNEP, a PNEP. And so his statement was in keeping with the Canadian Drugs and Substances Strategy, which, if if you uh, will recall, was was... Under the Harper years, they removed harm reduction as a pillar of the drugs and substances strategy. Under the new liberal government, they reinstated harm reduction. So he's referring to this new strategy where they reinstated harm reduction. The government of Canada is committed to protecting the health and safety of all Canadians, including people in prison. So then um, they implemented, they introduced a PNEP in two prisons, 
They did not call it a pilot, which some people I think mischaracterize as a pilot. They called it the first of a scale up across all 43 federal prisons. And they said, we're just going to start with these two institutions, Atlantic and um, I'm afraid Grand Valley. So those are the first two, Ontario and uh, Nova Scotia. And those are the first two that started in 2018. Um, and what was the response? Um, the key response and the biggest opposition to the program came from the union, the Union of Canadian Correctional Officers, who really mobilized in response to the announcement from the minister and the implementation of the programs. Um, they, as you can see from this photo, there was they they produced a huge needle. Um, they took it to Ottawa. They um, rallied um, from coast to coast and approached a number of members of parliament and, and the minister of public safety to say they were opposed to the program. And their key concern was that um, it would pose a security threat. And so um, just a note on that is that from the research that's been conducted for the past 30 years, there's never been a situation where a, a needle from one of these programs has been used as a weapon against any staff, never, never in the history of these programs, and they've been running for more than 30 years. And as I mentioned in one of my earlier slides, there are unregulated, I would call them unregulated PNAPs that exist in, in prisons today. Um, people are circulating, exchanging, sharing, reusing those pens and other makeshift equipment or something they took from healthcare or maybe healthcare um, shared with them under the table. And they're sharing that between 20, 30 people already. It's, I all call it unregulated PNAP. So the fact that um, there is now a, a regulated, although flawed PNAP in the federal prison system, I don't think poses an additional security threat is actually safer because people are using equipment that's not been shared with many, many other people. But this was a response from UCO. Um, and they also rallied in front of the courtroom when we were we had the hearing a very organized opposition. So um, uh, the rollout started in 2018, as I mentioned. Um, it's currently operating in nine or 10 federal prisons. It's not entirely clear where whether it's operating in Workworth right now. I, I believe it is. Um, and so there were some evaluations that were done in 2020 in the midst of COVID. Um, the Correctional Service of Canada commissioned a researcher from the University of Ottawa to evaluate the pre PNEP. And what she found was that, um, um, so sorry, maybe I'll just back up a little bit. The way the program works, the PNEP. So what a person has to do is first go to healthcare staff and say, hey, I want to participate in this program. The healthcare staff will help have a conversation with them, refer them to the other harm reduction measures that are in place, including OAT, o opioid agonist therapy, and then say whether or not they should be able to participate. And then the the their um, um uh, request goes to the warden or assistant warden. Warden, the warden or assistant warden then conducts what is called a, a threat risk assessment, and that is usually used in the context of other um, programming like epipens or pens for people who are diabetic to determine whether somebody's a manageable security risk. And we've tried to um, do some access to information requests to find out what exactly those security threats pose, and those are often redacted, so we don't have much information about that. We we've seen initially. Um, fairly high rates of refusal for participation. That's also borne out in subsequent research. But then the warden then conducts a threat risk assessment. And if the warden says yes, then you're allowed to participate in the program. If the warden says no, then you've effectively outed yourself as a person who uses drugs and wants to be in the program without being able to participate in the program. And then you have to sign a behavioral contract that says, you know, I will abide by the conditions of the program, which includes having your kits in a visible place. So you're given a kit. It has to be placed in a visible um, area in your cell. And every institution has its own protocol, like depending on where you keep the kit. And that kit has to be checked at least once daily. We've seen um, also protocols where you be, are checked twice daily. So when security, the correctional officers are doing their rounds in the institution, um, you have to show your kit. And again, you're um, potentially adding yourself to your cellmate, to other people on the range, and obviously to security. So everyone knows. And so what the evaluation did show was that there is this um, confidentiality concern. It's a security-based model um, because the overriding um, um, reason for denial of participation is security. It's not based on your healthcare needs. And the, the first evaluation that was done in 2020 showed that out of the um, two programs, there are 42 people who are enrolled nationally, which is quite low. 
given what we know about um, drug use inside, and Rhiannon can also speak more to that. And the latest numbers we saw were based out of um, an article that was reported at the International AIDS Conference um, when Cor Correctional Service of Canada indicated that at the time, and this is when the program had been rolled out already to nine prisons, only 53 per people were enrolled nationally. Um, the programs that are currently operating, I know uh, there, I think there's a question about the, the gender breakdown. All five of the women's federal prisons have a PNAP, and there's four men's federal prisons that have the PNAP. Um, and so, no, maybe before I go to Rhiannon, I'll just say that we lost a case in 2020. Um, the litigation that sort of prompted the, I think, the introduction of the program, what, what the judge said in the case was that because there's now a program that the Correctional Service of Canada in, introduced midway through the lawsuit, that it's premature to whether to determine whether or not it's sort of meeting people's needs. We need to give it time, and we need to trust that CSC is making a good faith effort to roll it out nationally, um, which is why we thought it was really, really important to conduct some research to see at whether it's actually working. Uh, the judge decided to defer to CSC in this case and say, let's see how it works before we actually determine whether the program is still violating prisoners' rights. So um, I'll pass it over to Rhiannon now. Thank you so much, Sandra. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the study, um, we did the interviews on Zoom because at the time we were really in the middle of COVID restrictions, um, as everyone I'm sure will remember. <laughs> Um, and then for recruitment, we targeted organizations that worked with former prisoners. So aid service organizations, harm reduction programs, halfway houses, things like that. Um, and of the 30 people that we spoke to, over two thirds of them identified as current or former people who use drugs. And over a third of them uh, identified as current or former people who were injection drug users, uh, either before, during or after prison or some combination of that. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of barriers and we'll talk about, I'll talk about those in just a second, but I think I'll move to talking about the context of drug use uh, inside first, just to give a little background on that. So um, very, very commonly discussed is that prescription drugs that were either prescribed, diverted, or used off script are regularly accessible. Although illicit drugs are also very accessible and used whenever available, but also as people may know, very expensive, you know, five times more, three times more, depending uh, on the drug uh, inside than in the community. Um, snorting drugs is probably the easiest accessible method besides swallowing drugs, but um, quicker uh, to get into your bloodstream. And many people use this method, but generally drugs are in kind of ingested uh, by the drug and personal preference, just like in the community. So for example, you know, powder cocaine would be snorted or injected. Crack you would probably only smoke crystal meth or heroin fentanyl could be any of those things. Um, and cannabis, for example, you would want to smoke it uh, just because the smell attracts attention. Um, another important piece, as Sandra already spoke to, is this idea that needles and syringes can be used as weapons. Um, because people have to hide drug use, they also have to hide their homemade or illicitly acquired syringes. Uh, which they wouldn't want to identify during a search. So as Sandra said, if you are in the program, for example, you have to show your kit, but if you are getting some of those syringes or homemade uh, equipment, uh, you would not want to identify that. Um, so um, that'd be more likely to kind of come up uh, as potentially dangerous during a search. The other thing about concealing drug use is that it also increases the risk of fatal overdose, um, particularly with opioids. And lots of people spoke about that, um, having seen those um, fatal overdoses and some non-fatal overdoses inside. Um, and then, you know, just kind of further on that point, the scapegoating PNEP syringes kind of makes no sense. <laughs> As the quote says there, you know, People, you know, there are needles for other purposes. So, you know, people have needles for beating um, or they have 
the, these those illicitly obtained or um, homemade uh, syringes. People also have hidden weapons completely unrelated to drug use and violence is pretty common. So, you know, as the quote says, and I remember, I remember this person, um, sorry, my mouse just decided to die. Um, you know, they're using it as an excuse not to do it. We have knives, we have everything you want. If a man wanted to do that, he does not need a needle to do that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so then if we wanna move on to key barriers. Uh, the first one being, um, issues, as Sandra talked a lot about, the issues around confidentiality, surveillance, and privacy. So there's a few quotes there, um, but I think also Sandra mentioned this, there is very little privacy in prisons anyways, um, you know, from between fellow inmates and prison staff. So most people, as you can see from those co quotes, um, thought that guards knew who was enrolled in the program or even who had applied for the, for the program. Uh, likely related to the threat risk assessment. Some people thought that they learned this from medical, um, although there was also, you know, varying degrees of, you know, a lot more respect for medical staff, uh, I guess, depending on the institution. Um, regardless, as mentioned, having to show your kit outs you as um, an intravenous injection drug user uh, that leads to increased attention um, from other inmates, cell searches, and so on from guards. Um, so the next key barrier um, is around related stigma, punishment, removal of privileges. Uh, CSC has a clear zero tolerance, zero tolerance, excuse me, policy on drugs. Um, and since there's very little information about the PNEP disseminated in the prisons, it kind of means that the prisoners find it really difficult to have trust in the program. Um, many people are kind of familiar with needle syringe distribution, harm reduction programs on the outside. And they know that a harm reduction program is supposed to help people be safer, but they did not feel that the program inside the PNEP did. Uh, and stigma was talked about a lot as a, another huge barrier, both again from other prisoners and from guards, especially for people in women's prisons. So people who identified as parents, for example, struggled with this especially um, because often they've lost custody of their children. There's a culture of you know shame around using, you know, this idea that you're supposed to get it together in prison. Um, but this kind of also dry, can drive use further underground. So people spoke not only of extra searches and unwanted attention from having to show their kits, but also of bullying and, you know, very commonly derogatory negative comments. Um, and overall, there was a clear and consistent concern about the pro program causing privileges to be revoked or that it might hinder um, parole, getting paroled. Um, so the possibility of institutional drug charges related back to the zero tolerance policy um, might, and that, so that kind of issue might send someone, get someone to send a proxy to go get a kit. So you get someone else to sign up for the program to get your, your uh, equipment. Um, and then also potentially losing access to programming was a worry for, so for some people completing programs was mandatory. And I, I, was just looking at the report again and it reminded me of a conversation where you know someone was saying that they had to spend twice as much time inside because of covid lockdowns and there was um you know because of that any outside programming was not coming in um and remembering also that you know covid could have only been brought into the prisons um when all that started so COVID meant that already scarce programming was particularly precious. And then, you know, that adds even more to the fact that people don't want to do anything that are going to keep them in there longer or hinder their access to the programming. Um, so that kind of leads us to the next key barrier, which is generally the lack of knowledge or misunderstanding about how the PNAP worked. So most of the people we interviewed had seen a poster in healthcare and that was typically how people had heard about it, but few knew really very much about how the program worked. 
which really reduced the trust in the program and really decreased the likelihood that people were going to enroll. Um, it was very clear from the interviews um, that consultation with prisoners who understood how prisons worked 24 hours a day who were there, they did not get to leave, and especially people with an injection drug use experience, that, that it could have improved the success of the program by having input into the design before the rollout. You know, people inside have very diverse perspectives, um, and those perspectives are the ones that prison administrators would not be able to see from their position. Um, and that leads us to recommendations. So a lot of these recommendations are very similar to the ones that were in the first report um, done. Um, so, you know, removing administrative barriers, enhancing, oops, excuse me, I just lost you here. Enhancing um, confidentiality, you know, getting rid of the threat risk, excuse me, threat risk assessment. Um, you know, anonymity, including surveillance, was cited as being absolutely crucial to improving the program. Education for guards and other staff, not only about the program and its benefits uh, and around drug use stigma, but also just generally about how HIV and hep C transmission and infection occur. Um, because people, you know, in the general public just don't always know that. Um, and then more education for prisoners could just look like a, something as simple as, you know, when people come in in orientation and they arrive at the institution, providing information about the program at that point so that everybody knows about the program, which would just decrease stigma um, just generally about it. And then people could share information. Uh, and then of course, um, uh, excuse me, having a diverse kind of type of materials available. So as I mentioned before, sorting drugs is really common, but it was only syringes that are available through the program. So, you know, having snorting equipment, smoking equipment, these things would be really helpful. People know about this stuff on the outside. They know how to use it. Um, and then most importantly, again, consultation with prisoners and people who use drugs, you know, Nothing about us without us is kind of a mantra, mantra, excuse me. <laughs> Drug user activists and other human rights activists uh, have been saying for a really long time, and it's not really to be taken for granted. It's, you know, we continue, we end up continuing to uphold systems that we, you know, critically analyze, uh, that re reproduce the same kind of programs, coming with the same kind of grants that are really designed to meet the needs of service providers and often not really the people who need them and use them. So involving the people whose lives are impacted most by HIV and Hep C from the very beginning at the inception of these projects will improve programs and research design by default. Um, so uh, most recently there is news about uh, PNEP. So just this past October, the CBC released an article about expansion. So they had sources naming six federal institutions in New Brunswick, Alberta, BC, Ontario, and Quebec um, that are slated for consultation and potential expansion of the program, which is really great news. Um, however, there is no, there are no plans to update the program, uh, including, importantly, terminating the threat risk assessment, how the kits are distributed or any of the other program designs that kind of make it inaccessible and stigmatized. Um, so in other words, expansion absolutely needed um, and with further development. Uh, interestingly, however, uh, the as Sandra mentioned, the uh, Union of Canadian Correctional Officers who do not support PNEP are actually in favor of OPS, so overdose prevention sites. Um, within prisons. So there are currently two open um, in Alberta and Nova Scotia, and a third, uh, this article mentioned, in Collins Bay on its way. Uh, so in Collins Bay, they're actually in the middle of planning consultations and renovations. Uh, and this is particularly interest to, to this research project um, because the interviewees, especially those who had been in the federal system for longer, um, talked about Collins Bay as standing out 
as an institution that had a lot of illicit drugs coming in and being used. Um, so, you know, really hope that this development will work towards improving and saving lives. Um, and finally, uh, you know, programs in prisons need to mirror what's offered on the outside. Uh, they need to have diverse offerings, models that are designed by and for people who use drugs and who are affected by HIV and hep C. I'm just going to pipe in and say those are, that's, thank you, Rhiannon. Those are our um, contacts and you can find the report also on our website. Um, and that takes us to the end of our presentation. Stop sharing. Thank you so much, Rihanna and Sandra, for that interesting presentation. We'll now move on to a Q&A. I'll just share my screen quickly. So here we go. All right. So um, as we move on to the q and I'd like to remind you that the session will be taking place using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. You can submit your questions using this tab, and you can also like other people's questions to push them up in priority. I'll now stop sharing so that I can see any questions coming in. We did have a question come in at the start um, of uh, what someone that uh, had submitted it when they registered. And so this person was wondering, um, who pays for the needle exchange products? And are there any data collection of supplies taken? Um, I can pipe in, Rhiannon. Uh, so the Correctional Service of Canada um, it, it is responsible for the healthcare provision of all people under its custody. So it comes out of the CSC's own healthcare budget. Um, we don't know, I, I don't, I don't think we, we don't have access to the inventory and how many people have used it. The, the numbers, as I mentioned before, were from the Correctional Service of Canada's evaluation, which showed very low uptake. And, um, one of the things that we also critiqued, uh, we didn't mention specifically was this model is a one for one exchange, which we know in the community is not good practice. Um, but it does require returning of your used equipment in order to access a new one. So, um, I'm not sure with which frequency people are returning the equipment, but we know, like, as I mentioned, like in the middle fifties was the latest numbers we got across nine institutions in 2022. Mm. I would also add anecdotally that people talked about that, you know, one person might get a kit and it was shared. So the numbers of distribution might not reflect the numbers of people who are using the equipment. Okay, thank you. And we had another question um, sent ahead of time um, talking about, um, you know, have you seen any differences in the PNP enrollment and accessibility results for women compared to men? So you had, you had mentioned that um, all five women federal prisons have PNEP and, and four men's and, um, but I was wondering, Perhaps you could elaborate on um, on the results of you know barriers to enrollment and accessibility um, for women um, in comparison to men for this program. I think it's hard to say with some certainty because I'm again relying on CSC's evaluation, which is all we have access to, unfortunately. Um, and I remember at the time there were very few expressions of interest, meaning. When the first step when you even just go to healthcare, um, there were some, I think in um, at least two or three of the women's institutions, so they had the program running for a few years already, there were zero expressions of interest. Um, and then, so I think on balance, there are probably more expressions of interest from the men's prison, but we don't have a gender breakdown of who was actually participating in the program. Like of those 40 or 50 people, I don't, I don't have a gender program uh, breakdown. Okay, thank you. So not seeing any questions submitted just yet. I'll ask some questions um, that I have prepared ahead of time. Um, so you were talking about this, um, OPS or overdose prevention services, um, such as the one at Drumheller and Spring Hill and the 
um, new one, come, the third one coming at Collins Bay. Have there been any further conversations regarding expanding supervised consumption services um, in uh, correctional facilities that to complement the PNEP? So to have kind of both um, at the same time? Ren, jump in anytime. I'm able to just, I'll just take this one quickly. Um, the from what we understand, um, the it's it seems like the institutions selected so far have either got, gone with one or the other program. And as Rihanna mentioned, we don't think they need to be pitted against each other. They can be both. The both programs can be implemented in in an institution. The Union of Canadian Correctional Officers has been strongly in favor of the OPS. The rationale for it is it's that the, the equipment is in a controlled setting. People don't bring it back to their cell. Um, our concern from the get-go has always been the like the fact that you're going to an OPS means you're also like despite the lack of privacy for PNEP and generally in prison, the fact that you have to take your illicit substances to an OPS means there's zero guarantee of confidentiality. Like um, I remember watching a presentation from one of the security staff at um was it was at Drumheller. And he mentioned, he called it like the the yellow brick road. I think that was the term he used for it. And he's like, as long as you're following the yellow brick road to the OPS, no one's going to touch you. But you're in clear view of everybody. Like to me, that just seemed a bit of a absurd notion that you will be going to people know you're going to the OPS. You, you're carrying your contraband because all illicit substances are contraband. And then you're using in the presence of healthcare staff and then returning to your cell. Um so we had concerns with that, but there's clearly people like it's been CSCs determined the OPS to be a success because there were, uh, I think, hundreds of, of visits. That's how they documented. I don't think it's by person, but it's by the number of visits that have been received at the OPS. And there were hundreds of visits, I think, at, that they shared at um, a presentation at the AIDS conference in Montreal last summer. And so they said that's a success. And then the, I think the correction officers much prefer it. Um but again, we there's certainly people, and maybe Brianna can talk to it. I'm certain some people just never use the OPS because it means there's so little confidentiality associated with it. And we would argue to have both in all prisons. You don't need to have one or the other. But in, as far as conversations go, uh, we have spoken in Correctional Service of Canada, and they had at the time indicated a commitment to scaling at the PNEP. Um, but I'm not sure how that will work vis-a-vis um, -vis the OPS. Rihanna, do you want to say something about what people said about the OPS? Sure. So um, I don't think I spoke to anybody where there was an OPS just because of timing and when those opened and when we did the interviews. But um, certainly people expressed interest in it and thought it would be really helpful. Um, but not if it was in a separate location, as you just described, Sandra. So what I heard from people was if it was in healthcare already. So you, this is very similar to say, you know, an OPS or harm reduction program that's located in a multi-service organization. So you could go in off the street and not, um, you know, not be targeted for only going to this service. There, are, you know, obviously pros and cons of both, but um, uh, yeah. So if people could go to healthcare and, you know, quietly go into an OPS, maybe more people would use that. But as Sandra said, there is going to be some people who will never use an OPS um, because for various reasons, their uh, drug use and particularly injection drug use, they just don't want anyone to ever see. Um, and kind of related to that, I would also say that lots of people talked about how, you know, some people, and again, this is very much the same as it is in the community, um, some people um like to use drugs with other people and you know we'll kind of find a place um to hang out and do that and then there are other people who only use alone they do not want anyone to see them you know it's very private so you know this is why it's so important to have options thank you so much for answering that question we have another question that just came in through the chat. So it says, this may be more of a rhetorical question, so I apologize in advance, but I find it so troubling to see how much stigma there is and lack of confidentiality due to the level of enforcement. 
How can we, as healthcare providers and the general public, help to advocate for protecting people's confidentiality and right to safe supplies? If run by peers or by healthcare, why does there need to be a warden and CO involvement, especially if this is a healthcare issue as mentioned in this presentation? Thank you. I mean, I think that's a great question. Thank you for asking. I think challenging some of the misinformation about this programming is really important. Um, as a healthcare provider, you have that legitimacy in the prison system. And, and so I know at the time, the correctional officer at uh, the correctional union was um was was spreading a lot of in misinformation unfortunately they talked about um they talked about um they said that there were ops operating in france at the time which is not i mean we reached out to french colleagues because we they would have been first for us we we, do, we monitor what's happening globally and that was not true um they talked about um they inflated the risk I mean, and not that these are uh, i'm not valid concerns, but also inflated the risk of infection from um, from HIV and hepatitis C, from accidental needle pricks. Um, there was a lot of misinformation that that these were security threats. And as Rhiannon mentioned, like there are knives in the prison system. People are given razors to reduce the risk of hepatitis C transmission for shaving. And so, I mean, everybody said we have all these other things why we would use injection equipment. So like, I think also there's this notion, and we've done some also research on this, like that that the correctional staff have no responsibility for healthcare. That's kind of out of their remit. And so I think impressing on staff, if you work with correctional officers, that harm reduction is actually in healthcare would is a benefit to everyone. Like if you have a a um, people in prison who don't have um, HIV or hepatitis C. Um, Public health is, you know, it's 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 good. Prison health is is good for public health. So, I think just impressing on them that it's part of their mandate. Also, like harm reduction doesn't need to be, and um, opposed to the idea that it's a security, like it opposed to their their notion of what their responsibility is as guards. Um, but I think uh, challenging some of the misinformation is really important. So we mentioned some of the research that's been done over the years, and and then the research that Rhiannon also uh, was describing. A lot of that research that sort of documents all the health outcomes, um, and I didn't mention it so much, but the international research that shows that PNEPs do not increase drug use, they do not increase injection drug use, they do not lead to the use of needles as weapons, and they've reduced the risk of uh, sharing injection equipment and reduce the risk of, H risk of HIV and hepatitis C. And a little bit more less well known is they reduce the risk of overdose. And Rhiannon also alluded to that. I mentioned that in her in her side um, because people are not using as quickly. They're not having to share equipment, so they're not using all their substances at once or feeling that rush to inject. Um, so there's a lot of positive health outcomes coming from PNEP, and I wish if healthcare providers can share some of that and challenge some of the misinformation and stigma, that'd be great. I would also add, you know, just on a human level, you know, when we're trying to shift how people think about things, some people will respond to facts and that can be a really useful tool, but sometimes it's just really, you know, instead of kind of, you know, when you learn something new and you can be really judgmental around people who don't know that, you know, inviting questions, inviting a conversation, asking people, you know, what, why do you think that? And, you know, drumming up like just human stories um, can also be a really helpful way of kind of shifting how people think. And also opportunities like this where, you know, people who have experience, um, not just sharing research, but, you know, inviting people who um, use drugs, who are good speakers to answer questions and share uh, information about um, how they see things can really make a difference too. Thank you so much. So we have another question here. Um, so you mentioned um, many recommendations for the PNEP, have there been any recent developments with regards to the report's recommendations? So specifically, um, you know, maybe progress in adopting automatic dispensing machines and or PNEP peer distribution services or um, maybe orientation materials, um, welcome packages, et cetera. Um, so since releasing the recommendations, have you heard of any recent developments 
Um, I can take a stab at this. We we're ha there haven't been any um, changes as far as we know since we released this latest research report. But in the context of the litigation, there were two key changes that I think were were good things. So um, at the, when the PNP was first introduced in 2018, your participation in that program was reported to the Parole Board of Canada. And Rhiannon mentioned people talking about this and it being a concern, and they said um, it, it was a relevant factor for parole, which we would argue is it shouldn't be. Um, but a, a lot of people expressed concern, and we also, ex as an organization, expressed concern, and we cited it in the context of our lawsuit that this was a huge impediment, letting the Parole Board of Canada know that you're using drugs while incarcerated. And so since then, Correctional Services Canada has changed and said they would not automatically report um, participation to the parole board. I don't know if there's certain circumstances where they still might, but I think uh, the, the default option of reporting to parole board no longer happens. The second thing they did was um, there was something called the needs, let's look at a, um, um, their computer system for showing when people are participating in the program. It used to say, I think it used to say P&EP. Like, so say Signy, you're on the program, it'd say Signy, and then you'd have a needs flag that said you're on the P&EP. Now it's changed to just say um, you're a needle you're accessing needle equipment or something. So it could be, you could be either be using it for your EpiPen or because you have, you're using, you have access to a needle because of diabetics or some other reason that it's, so it's not specific to the PNEP. Having said that, the fact that you still have to show, like Rhiannon said, like even today, maybe it's not on the computer system, but you're still doing a visual inspection every day. The warden still has to approve your participation. Like those really key points about the threat risk assessment, those, as far as we know, are still, um, intact. Great, thank you. I think we have maybe time for one or two more questions. Um, so what are some impediments that still remain to implementing the report's recommendations? Or um, since releasing this report, what are some um, next steps in your, in your agenda? I, I can go, Rhiannon, can you jump in? Um, I think the impediment really is just lack of political will. Um, we've seen a lot of opposition, like I we mentioned from UCO, um, and there was even labor action at the context back in 2018 when the program was first in introduced. Um, there was job action by UCO um, saying it was uh, unsafe workplace for them. Um, so I think Correctional Services of Canada is contending with like, advocates like ourselves, people who who believe in harm reduction and believe in the need for this program, saying you need to do better. And then you have from the other side, this union who's really pushing back and say, don't do it at all. And if you have to do it, uh, the OPS is the lesser of two evils. I think that's actually the wording they use. It's the lesser of two evils. They see both of these things as evils. Um, so it's just a lack of political will, I think, um, from Correctional Service of Canada. Like they, they told us in the context of the lawsuit, they gave us a timeline. And I can't remember the specific time now, but it was all 43 prisons would have a program at the end of this set period. And it was definitely not five or six years. I can't remember the exact timeline now. So it's 2023. It's been five years now. And they've got them in nine or 10 prisons. So far below what they promised at the time. And I think it's because, um, well, sadly, the pressure of the lawsuit isn't on them because we lost. Um, I think if there was litigation and the judge said you you have a constitutional obligation to um, have this program in a certain way across all the prisons, then they would have to be held to that. Um, so there's no pressure of the litigation. There's a handful of organizations that are working on this specific issue, including ours. Um, so, and I think this, the, the, what I think we've been prioritizing is what the judge said at the time too, was like, there's just not enough research to show it's not working. So that's why this research was so important. We got a little bit of money and we put together this research to show that these are outside of our um, uh, this project. I think there's I know of one other researcher that's looked at the specific PNEP in, in um, Edmonton Institution for Women, but I don't know of any other academics or researchers looking into the barriers to this program in like a sort of a formal research um, way. So that's sort of been our priority to see whether the things that we anticipated happening like the barriers that we kind of anticipated going into this were actually reality. And as Rhiannon mentioned, they're definitely uh, barriers and there's not a lot of people participating. 
I think this also circles back to the question about, you know, what can service providers do? What can researchers do? And thinking about kind of the general context in the public, you know, people, a lot of people don't think about what's going on in prison. So the only people that care are the specific people who are looking into this. So, you know, keeping these issues on the forefront, just like Sandra said, prison health is public health. These are not two separate worlds. Um, so keeping those things on people's radar, not forgetting about them, initiating other research that kind of can, you know, just get more information out there about this subject um, will be really helpful. Okay, perfect. I'll leave a few more minutes um, if anyone has any extra questions. And seeing none, I will just share my screen quickly. And just give a big thank you to both of you for your presentations today. And thank you all attendees for joining us. We hope the information provided today will help you in your practice. Please fill out our short and anonymous evaluation survey, which will be emailed to you after the webinar. Your inputs, comments, and suggestions in the survey will help us plan our future webinars. The recording from today's webinar will be available on NCCID's website. Thank you, everybody, and have an excellent day.